Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Our guest today is Chris Blasi, president of Neptune Global Holdings, LLC. Chris is a veteran of the financial and investment world with over 25 years of experience. He is also the creator of the patented PMC Ounce, a unique investment asset that provides investors with exposure to gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. We're delighted to have Chris with us today as our guest. Good day, Chris, and welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? Great, Patrick. It's uh, really nice to be on your show. We're glad to have you, Chris. Uh, Chris, can you share with us a little about your uh, background and how you got into the precious metals business? Sure. Uh, prior to, to uh, launching Neptune Global in the precious metals world, I was in what you would call the traditional financial services world. I worked with a major sell-side broker-dealer and then for a time with a boutique M&A shop. And I had left that after a while and was working in big tech, but I was always a student of macroeconomics and, and finance. And I, on my own, I'd be studying and, and following it. And I got very involved and I liked, I was enamored by the cycle theories. Um, and that things really move in cycles and that from an investor perspective, the best in, way to make money is to identify a cycle early on, get in front of that and then, you know, let the momentum of that cycle take you as opposed to trying to just be a stock picker. So I through my research, I saw that precious metals, there were some people making a very good case. Now, to put this in perspective, we're talking the mid 90s, late 90s right now. Um, so it's now it's like 98, 99, and I'm starting to you know see the logic that there is going to be a sick, uh, secular move for the for gold and the precious metals in the near future. So not only was I believe so much in that, instead of just being an investor, I wanted to do more. So I started a company, started buying gold, a little bit of silver at the time. Uh, for myself and then a few other individuals. And to put this in perspective, Neptune Global was founded in 2001, virtually at the bottom of the gold market. Made our first real transaction for the company in late 2001. And then it evolved and we started bringing in more customers and then we became a traditional uh, precious metals dealer. So, you know, that is the, that's what was behind the founding of the company. Okay. Um yeah, and in, in speaking about gold, we, we've seen gold um, reach uh, 1900 level or so back in 2011. And then we've seen it reach its lows back in 2015. And since then, yes, gold has absolutely gone sideways. Um, these seven years or so that, that have um, that gold has been going down and sideways, it's been pretty trying for, for gold buyers and some they've even thrown in the in the towel. Um, some feel they should have put money in the stock markets and, and they would have probably been seeing a profit by now. But um, in your opinion, Chris, what are the, the factors that are contributing to putting the downward pressure on gold prices? Sure. So before I get into the specific on um, maybe what's tempering the gold price right now, I'd just like to take, take a step back and let's look at the time frame you talked about. And I will submit that gold is in its secular bull market and it's having a almost like a classic pattern and what i mean by that is the classic pattern is three legs first leg up then there's a retracement of about 50 percent of the gain and then there's the third leg and ultimately the third leg will be the most robust so if you look at gold bottoming in 2001 and we're talking in the in the mid twos like 280 an ounce it went from there to peaked at the 1900. Of course, it was briefly at 1900 in 2012. That was leg one. Then leg two was that pullback, which bottomed in December of 2015. And that was a 50% retracement of the gains from the, from the 280 up to the 19. So that was leg two. And that was a multi-year pullback. We've begun the third leg in January. It started in January of 2016. Gold was up in 16, up in 17. This, this year it is down to basically trading sideways. But when you take that bigger picture, 
it's really, we believe it's a classic three leg secular market and it's in the third leg. Now, right now it's in a flat to down. You know, what are some of the things tempering the price, price of gold, which was specific to your question? So why isn't it not completely taking off right now? Well, we're watching the do dollar rise. You know, there's a lot of geopolitical events uh, happening right now. There's the raising of interest rates in the U.S. and people will say, well, that's the death knell for gold. Um, on a very temporary basis, it is. Um, rising interest rates aren't necessarily uh, a destroyer of gold because if you look in the 1970s, you know, we, we had the inflation in the 1970s here in the U.S. Um, interest rates were rising. The Fed were usually behind the curve and, and gold had its tremendous run until Paul Volcker came in and really jacked up the rates. That's not going to happen now. As a matter of fact, how much, you know, the big debate is how much longer can the Fed really keep raising rates before it just chokes the economy? plus kill all the emerging market countries with huge piles of debt denominated in dollars. So this, this holding down of the gold price because of the Fed slightly raising rates and talking about raising it some more, the rally in the dollar, um, we believe this is just a temporary and the fundamentals that are going to be driving gold higher are still there and will still be propelling it. Okay. Yeah, that was that was going to be my my next question actually. Where um, the gold prices do they thrive in uh, higher interest rates or lower interest rates? Well, you know that's. I think there's um, we there's so many other factors that are gonna that are driving the gold price, and I think the biggest of all is the the massive amount of debt um, around the world. You know, there there's a debt situation here that. Um, as a classic example is what we have student loans, right? If you look at the financial crisis in 2008, which was kicked off by the subprime mortgages here, and you to you're talking about there was about a trillion dollars in subprime mortgages and about 5% were underperform were, were non-performing. And that caused, and that was, the, that was the trigger, right? Or the catalyst to the financial event in 2008. Fast forward now, student loan debt. The U.S. government is backing $1.6 trillion in student loans. And the default rate isn't 5%, it's 20% and rising. So there are, other, there are factors that are going to cause such disruptions. And there's going to be this, the creation of more and more cheap money um, yeah. you know, because of this debt situation. And... I think the Fed is going to be either behind the curve or whatever with interest rates. I think there's other things that are going to overpower, even if the Fed is talking about raising rates, which are going to make, make gold look less attractive. So I'm not really concerned about uh, the interest rates. I think the Fed, like going back to what I said you know, a few minutes ago, the Fed is going to be maybe a couple more uh, notches higher, uh, bringing the interest rates up, but they're going to end up chopping them. Um, so that's just, it's just being set up for, uh, for cutting them as we go into a, a recession here. But the, the debt problems are going to overwhelm, you know, everything. And uh, that's going to be the driver as people move away from assets with counterparty risk, like fixed income and equity, and into something like gold with, without counterparty risk. Okay. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> Alan Greenspan, he, I think he had a 5% head start, so to speak, that uh, – he was able to move down from back in uh, 2008 before they went down to zero. Um, this time, I, I, I don't think they're going to have much headroom. Uh, but besides this, uh, are the reasons to hold gold right now still strong? A absolutely, right? I Again, you know, the short term, people are throwing in the towel. You're 100% right, right? We Like yourself, right, we're dealing with investors. We see the sentiment. We see there's a degree of impatience, right? And we get it. People have been bu buying precious metals and gold, and they were expecting the prices to be much higher by now. And don't, anyway, now people have been in precious metals from earlier on in the whole secular bull market. They're still up substantially. You know, a lot of people did pile in, you know, in 2011 and 12 when things were peaking, which unfortunately many investors do. Right. right. They, you know, they buy the highs and sell the lows. Um, but we believe, you know, a person needs to hold tight right now. The prices where gold is at right now seem to be a pretty firm floor. 
you know, uh, a, a level of support. So we feel it's still a good opportunity to be moving in that the fundamentals that have been laid out as the case for gold over the last five, mm -hmm. six, 10 years are still strong, stronger than ever. Um, I think the biggest risk and, you know, some people, this isn't we're talking our book, but the reality is if you get that break in the market and you get another financial event of equal or greater magnitude of 2008, the flight into the precious metals, people will then find out how little there actually is in physical right. form. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, seeing, I'm sure you've seen it too, times in yeah. the past when there has been a bit of a run and all of a sudden, you know, there isn't an availability of gold or silver. And, um, you know, it's very easy for this market to, to total the available supplies to completely evaporate. So short answer to question, the fundamentals are there. You need to hold tight. This is a war going on. This is a financial war. And people should expect that there's a, there's another side, the anti-gold side and, and everything that represent in this, represents in the financial world. And the last thing they want to see is gold rising. So, you know, like any war, it gets really ugly in the middle. But we believe the gold investor is on the right side and they will be vindicated and they will uh, they will appreciate what they put themselves in in the next several years. Yeah. OK. You um you mentioned the uh, student debt. Uh, we have a pretty outrageous uh, national debt. Uh, we've even had the IMF saying there's going to be a global reset back in uh, 2014. Um, how beneficial is physical gold compared to other assets in an investor's portfolio? Well, the you know, I think a lot of uh, individuals who haven't studied gold and understand its real value and don't understand the benefit of having something without counterparty risk. And this is where a lot of people who are kind of even they start to get involved and maybe consider gold. Um, they need to be into physical gold, not funds, you know, not derivatives, um, you know, something that, you know, stored non in the non bank uh, depositories. But the benefit of having something without counterparty risk and to fully understanding what that means, right, understanding what the counterparty risk is with equities and fixed income. I think there's a there's a, there's a lot of uh, a lack of knowledge about exactly what that means with a lot of people who aren't in the gold world and they'll find out you know for most of them when it's too late after and that's why it should be in the portfolio but people also confuse gold is not you know the the detractors to gold will say well it doesn't give you in, you know doesn't pay interest and all that I hear that all the time and we yeah. get it. We get it, but there's a reason for that. When something's paying you interest, there's a counterparty risk to that because the person paying the interest, how viable are they? Are they going to be able to continue to make those payments, right? And gold doesn't have that. So it's a store of value. It's really the fixed the fixed store of value. Um, and the currencies and everything else are, are moving up and down against gold. People think it's the reverse, but that's why gold should be in your portfolio. Chris, you touched on the uh, secular bull market. How significant would this third leg be uh, for gold prices? I mean, do you have a ballpark number you'd be looking at where gold might be as far as price? Well, first I'll talk about, so on these secular bull markets, the three legs, the third leg is always the biggest gains. Yes. So if you just look in perspective, you know, leg one went from, We'll just round it up a little to keep conservative, $300 an ounce to 19. You look at what kind of percentage gain that is. According to history, um, financial history and, and uh, chartists and, and such, the third leg will outdo that. And if you use those same multiples, then you look at some of the calls some other analysts are making for gold, gold of 5000 or $10,000 an ounce. And you can see where that makes sense. So I, you know, I won't give a specific number. It'll be significantly higher than here. And just using logic and uh, you know understanding charting and also just the fundamentals. Do the fundamentals support some of the claims that are you know being made of the projected price? And I would say yes, they do. And the the five thousand and and higher numbers that we've heard are seem very viable. So 
safe to say that that you see gold as a, as an investment. Do you also see it as a type of insurance? Yes, Patrick is financial insurance. It's the it's really the counter um, to most everything else in your portfolio, and that's why it's so critical to have. And you know, one thing I say to you know, say to people is also be careful what you wish for, right? So gold is like financial insurance, and that means if gold's five thousand an ounce or higher. What kind of world are we in right now? It doesn't mean you don't get insurance, but let's equate it to life insurance, right? If I have a big life insurance policy and, you know, my family's the beneficiary and they they reap the 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 payout. Well, that's great that they got taken care of. But what does that mean for me? Right. So the when the insurance kicks in, usually there's a negative event. That's why you have insurance. So you need this insurance goal, but don't. I don't believe people should be too anxious to see five thousand, ten thousand dollar gold, um, because everything else in their portfolio would probably be getting crushed. Not right. to mention probably some of the social and uh, and cultural issues, and you know some of the societal issues that are going on that would be quite unpleasant. So you know, in my personal opinion, I just like to see if gold was allowed to maybe trade a little more freely and watch it gradually go up over a d- couple decades than a rapid rise to five or ten thousand dollars that would be um you know that would be probably very troubling times which i'd rather not experience yeah i hear you um same um we we've had um excuse me we've had uh, quite a few guests on this show we talk about gold silver crypto things like that i don't think we've ever talked about platinum and and palladium so i hope to get uh, your views on on both of these metals um platinum Traditionally, it's been a bit more expensive than gold, but lately, a couple of years back, I think platinum actually went under gold, and um, gold prices have been higher the past few years. Uh, how's platinum doing? What, what's going on with, with platinum? Sure. So platinum and palladium, uh, part of the precious metals complex, of course, um, but they're really purely industrial metals, right? I mean, there's a little bit of platinum jewelry, but I don't, you know, that's not such a major driver. And everyone knows the main application, right, in pollution control devices, right, for for vehicles. So the other dynamic to platinum and palladium is their scarcity, meaning they predominantly come out of two countries, South Africa and Russia, as opposed to gold and silver, which are mined all around the world. So you have a geopolitical risk element to it when you're into two countries. And the two countries that they're found in one is very unstable, South Africa, <clears throat> you know, mine disruptions, um, they they have political chaos over there and it seems to be getting worse. So you wonder how reliable is it, it's going to be, you know, supplies coming out of there. And the other being Russia, you know, at least from the United States perspective, that's a tent, that's a tight relationship right now. Um, so, you know, that's a very dicey element to it. Now, Platinum has been going down the last couple of years, but palladium has been going up exponentially. Yeah. Now, the reason for this is historically in the past, catalytic converters for diesel and gas engines were platinum based. Palladium has been taking the gas market away from platinum. So palladium is being used in catalytic converters for uh, gas engines. Platinum remains the metal for diesel engines. But you can see that, you know, so that taking away of the market share has kind of tempered platinum as palladium has gone up. So that's real. That's a supply and demand dynamic. You know, they're, they're not like gold. It's not about debt. It's not about, you know, fiat currency. It's not about faith in fiat currency. This is really a supply and demand. And it's really the palladium kind of taking market share away from platinum, which is why palladium is ramped up so much and platinum is, is kind of been down. Okay. Do you see palladium as being a bit overvalued right now, or are there still quite a bit of upside to palladium? Sure. So I think what's probably happening, right, there's, there isn't news on this type of stuff, so you're kind of using a, a speculation. Um, I think from a logical perspective, what's probably happening is I think the price is firm right now, and I think there's a concern with manufacturers who, are rely, who rely on palladium for their products, seeing a lot of geopolitical tensions, the potential for supply disruption, 
and they're probably stockpiling, right? They're probably buying it because you don't want to be caught short, right? What are you going to do if you're a manufacturer and, and your product requires palladium for your output and you get some sort of supply disruption or even big price spike? Logically, you'd say, maybe I should pay up a little bit now and start building an inventory. So, you know, I think, you know, I, I don't think we're at a, a, a bubble in, in palladium that's going to come crashing down. Um, platinum has been down so much. I think it's a it's a bargain right here. Um, but I think palladium is is fairly safe. But palladium, it's not uncommon to see days where the moves could be twenty, thirty dollars. You know, people have seen that. Um, I think they should expect that going forward. So it's not uncommon that there's going to be some big price swings, but um, I don't see it as coming crashing down to price levels of where it was several years ago. Okay. Yeah, I know um, <clears throat> lately Palladium has been having a pretty good bump, um, but there is a, a bit of concern where um, electric vehicles, where they're starting to, to come into the market, do you think that will have any effect on the, the Palladium price or demand? Sure. I, I think that's a, a an initial reaction. People will say the electric vehicles are going to cut into their to their market. Um, they are the the amount of electric vehicles. We'll look here in the United States, right? Electric vehicles are highly are expensive. They're luxury vehicles, and we see them being purchased in you know affluent markets here. It's a tiny fraction of the overall market. Also, in a lot of the emerging market countries, as these people start buying their first cars. They're not going to be paying up for the prices of electric cars. So those are going to be your regular internal combustion engines. So the long and the short of it is really for the next 10, 15 years, there's going to be plenty of internal combustion engines. I don't see the the takedown or the, the, the growth in the electric versus the growth in just internal combustion engines in, in emerging markets as being so significant to really damage that market for palladium. So I think it's pretty safe for a while. I think it's a it's maybe a quick reaction. People think that it's a death knell. Um, but no, internal combustion engines, gas engines are going to be around for a while. And there'll be a plenty of them. So palladium, there'll be investors that will do quite well in palladium over the next decade before maybe there really needs to be a concern about, you know, the future of uh, internal combustion engines. So, you know, people get a little ahead of themselves and don't realize how long it takes for these things to really roll out in a major way. There isn't much of an infrastructure for charging cars up on roads and all that. And that's even here in the United States with a fairly, you know, we'll say, you know, first world infrastructure. So, you know, countries like China and such, I think it's a, it's a ways before that threat is going to be real, if it ever does become real. Okay. Um we often hear um, from guys like David Morgan how the silver market is is such a small market. Relative to that silver market, how do um, platinum and palladium um, their size compared to the silver market? Yeah, they're they're small markets too, but they're and they're different. The thing is, it's really kind of an apples and oranges um, in the respect. You know, gold is the monetary metal, silver is the quasi. You have some people buying it because of the dollar, right? And some people buying it because of its industrial use. And platinum and palladium are pure industrial metals. So sometimes making direct comparisons is, I think, a little, uh, little off, a little misleading. Um, there isn't, like you take palladium. Palladium has been doing tremendously well. There really isn't a retail market for palladium. Very few individual retail investors have palladium, where silver, right, there's people buying the silver coins and, and bars for investment purposes. So it is an apples and oranges, um, you know, and there's a little bit of retail market for platinum, you know, obviously much more than palladium. But um, I think they're, they're small markets like silver, but they are different markets than silver. And I think you got to watch making too close a comparison between the two and thinking they're going to track each other. Um, I mean, if you just look over the last couple of years, silver's doing terribly, <laughs> platinum's doing terribly, and palladium's doing tremendously yeah. well. So right there, that's telling you these are different markets. And, you know, don't follow the cues of one to decide if that's why you should be either buying or selling in the other. Okay. So that's a good point. Um, but being that... Uh platinum and palladium are, are industrial metals, would they be susceptible to uh, economic recessions? 
Absolutely. Right. If you had a big curtailment in auto production, um, if the global economy was to shrink and uh, and stagnate, that would be a threat to them. Absolutely. Uh, because they are pure industrial metals. I mean, the only the only from an investment perspective, what they do share with gold and silver are some of the other positive attributes that all precious metals have, meaning things like, you know, they're rare. Um, they, they don't rust and, and, and go away. They're divisible. They're portable. You know, they're a, a great concentration of wealth in a small unit. Um, they're true hard assets without counterparty risk. So they'll have that element to it. So even if you're going through a recessionary period, when the recessionary period comes out, if you own platinum and palladium, they're going to be viable. They're not going to expire. So that's a that's a protection from the down the ultimate downside. Um, but yes, there can definitely be a contraction in their prices with a big global recession. Okay, yeah, because um, palladium it's a bit of a mysterious metal, and um, we we get the question all the time: Should I buy platinum or, or palladium? So, Chris, I'm going to pass that question on to you. Should we be buying platinum or, or palladium? So, Patrick, my answer to that is: We at Neptune are strong believers in a diversified portfolio. And that's even within an asset class like precious metals. Now, we believe that there's a logical weighting. Um, you know, gold is still the primary precious metal, but there's a place for a certain amount of platinum and palladium in the portfolio. So the metals don't move in lockstep, right? Now, before I jumped on your show today, today was a great example. Uh, gold was down, silver, platinum, palladium are up. These are, you know, if you look at the markets on a day to day basis, most days, one or two are up, then a couple are down. You don't know when something's going to hit its stride. Five, six years ago, no one could have anticipated what happened with platinum and palladium. So trying to outthink the market and going all in on one or taking an outsized position in something like platinum and palladium, to me, would not be prudent. You know, even if you like the story with one, you still take a logically weighted position. Now, we kind of produced, created a product to meet that need. Yes. So, yes. you know, and it's a, it's a way for investors to instantaneously buy, uh, you know, a unit that has a certain amount of gold, silver, platinum, palladium, physically backing it up. So it's an easy to trade price efficient way of doing it. And especially when you're talking about what we call the logical allocation, if an investor is coming in with modest, you know, funds, you know, Twenty, thirty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, even a couple hundred. Right. You know, you're not going. You don't want to be putting too much in palladium, right? So, you know, if you're going in and you're only buying a handful of ounces, that's not going to be the most price effective way building that portfolio. You know, on your own. So, you know, we offer something that's a, a patented product, but it's all physically backed. But for any investor especially if you have enough resources where you can diversify a little bit more across the precious metals, there is a, there is a place to have a, a logically weighted allocation toward platinum, palladium in conjunction with your gold and silver. Of course, gold would still be the primary one, which should still be about 50%, a little, maybe 55 maximum of the total amount of the dollars going into precious metals. Okay. Yeah. I was, just heading there where um, I, I was hoping you could uh, explain to our listeners or, or tell them a bit about uh, Neptune Global and what the PMC ounce is. Sure. So the PMC ounce stands for precious metals composite, which is exactly what it is. Um, I guess a good way to visualize it is you think of a pizza, right? And we use the term an ounce because that's what precious metals are quoted in. And a pizza with four slices, but the slices are uh, logically weighted. You know, one being gold, one being silver, platinum, palladium. So that means each PMC ounce you buy, there's a fixed fractional amount of gold, silver, platinum, palladium that's stored in a special allocated account, a non-bank depository. And depending on the number of PMC ounces you buy, that's going to determine what is what, how much you own, how much gold, silver, platinum, palladium you own. And that weighting the P, uh, because of this diversified position and the weighting which we've constructed, the PMC ounce provides a better risk adjusted return than being in one or two of the metals on its own. And that's not theory. It's been in the marketplace for 10 years. 
Um, you know, right on our, our website, it shows the, the price change in the PMC ounce versus gold, silver, platinum. It's ahead of gold, silver, and platinum. And the purpose of it, we're not buying and selling metals. We're not a fund. We're not trying to beat the market. But just this logically weighted position provides a better risk adjusted return. And what we mean by that is it moves with less volatility than if you're in just one or two of the metals on their own. You know, great example is silver because so many precious metals investors have a position in silver. You know, you probably had the same experience. There was a lot of people that piled into silver in 2011 and 12. And people were saying, you know, it was imminent that silver was going to go to 100 or 200. You know, here we are at 14 and change. I mean, silver has had the biggest hit by far. Yeah. And it, I believe silver will be fine in the years to come. But in the interim, you know, if you needed to raise cash and you had a big long position in silver, you know, that's a painful thing. But, you know, the PMC ounce has a lot of silver in it, but the other metals modified and tempered that volatility. So the theory that was behind the construction and creation of the PMC ounce has proven to be correct for over 10, for 10 years. And, you know, that's why, uh, you know, that's why we, we feel it's a it's a good allocation, and that's why we firmly believe in a allocation within the precious metals market beyond just gold and silver. Okay, yeah, because that that was one of the the questions um, we we were looking at where um, uh, the reasoning behind silver having I think a ninety three point seven five percent allocation uh, within the the PMC ounce. Yes, that's a so that's a great point. That's the physical weighting. Now, of course, if First blush, a person goes, well, if something is 93.75% silver, it's all silver, but it's not. So we have a tool in there called the PMC calculator. It lets you go in and do a simulated trade. And what you find is, even though silver is physically the majority of the PMC ounce, but based on how many dollars are going into silver, you can see where the logic is because you weigh your investment allocation by the dollars going in, not units, right? So if you had $100,000 and you said, I want to put half into gold, half into the silver, that means $50,000 in gold, 50000 in silver, not an ounce of gold for each ounce of silver, or else you'd end up with a almost all your money going into gold because silver is such a low price point item. So if you go into the PMC calculator, you type in the, you type in the number of ounces you want to buy, it shows you how much gold, silver, platinum, palladium is acquired. It shows you the dollar amount going in and the percentage. And you'll see that right now gold is like 52% of each dollar. And even though silver is physically 93 and change percent of each PMC ounce, the allocation is only – the your dollars are about 20 cents of each dollar. So there's the logic. Now, the palladium, palladium is only 1.75%. But palladium has gone up so much in price right now, it's actually the amount of do the, the dollar percentage going into palladium is higher. But some people say, well, then maybe I'll try to construct something on my own because maybe palladium is a little high. And our answer is you can't time the markets. You know, people thought palladium was a little high when it was 800 an ounce. Now it's 1100. So the PMC ounce takes care of all that. When silver starts hitting its stride, it will benefit from that. When palladium start, um, excuse me, platinum starts hitting its stride, it'll be, it'll take advantage of that. So it's a simple, logical way to have this diversified position. And um, as I said, the, the PMC calculator tool really crystallizes exactly what the composition is and the logic between it behind its allocation. Okay, so um, so just to clarify a bit, uh, is the metals uh, the weighting? Is it permanently? fixed regardless of, of the prices of, of precious metals or do they also move permanently fixed permanently fixed okay Ab absolutely for a couple of reasons first of all if you changed it if you created a product this and, and said each time someone buys a pmc ounce i'm going to put 50 cents of each dollar into gold the amount of gold would be different each time so no pmc ounces would be the same they'd have all different weightings and there'd be no way to publish a price it wouldn't have that you know that easy to track a PMC ounce sold five years ago has the exact same composition as one today. So it would defeat, you couldn't function. You would just be then creating custom portfolios. Um, and you wouldn't have the ease of buying and selling and tracking and, and such. So, but the weighting has proved that despite the price moves, it is, 
it's all it's always outperforming on a risk adjusted basis the metals on their own so there was a lot of uh, logic and there was a lot of research that went in when the product was created looking at the history of the price moves and it <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> and it's proved to have been a viable and it's a uh, product and it performs as it's designed to do okay chris you had me at pizza um but <laughs> How and where are, are the metals in the PMC ounce stored? Sure. So the metal is all what they call LBMA approved, good delivery bullion. As a dealer, you know what exactly what that means. It's all in bar form. So it's all, you know, from the PAMP and Credit Suisse and all the major refiners, you know, meets all the standards. All the gold is four nines and uh, same standards for the silver, platinum, palladium. It's all stored in a non-bank bullion depository. Uh, we use a, a, a globally recognized, fully insured, non-bank bullion depository. Um, this is an, all held in a special allocated account. The ownership of the metals are recorded down at the depository level. You know, we provide a, a um, multi-stream reporting um, from the buys and the sells and the holdings of the metals. Multi-stream meaning from both us and the depository confirming the metals are there. So we've really put all these... Uh, pieces in place for, you know, the, the peace of mind and assurances that people want with all the insurances they want and the fact that it's all, you know, all good delivery bullion. So it's, it's as easy to sell, um, you know, as if you're it's like, a, like an ETF, but you actually own the metal and the metal's all there in good delivery form. I just want to be an encouragement to the precious metals investors that, you know, these are rough and tumble markets, right? There's a war going on out there. There's a lot at stake for the other side. You know, gold and precious metals being the victor means obviously other class, other asset classes would be suffering, right? So, you know, there's a war going on, you know, hold tight. You know, you have to have, you know, you need to have this uh, these metals in your portfolio, your overall portfolio, and uh, don't get caught up on the day-to-day -day moves. Also, step back and look at the big picture. And when you look at the big picture, like I said, that secular, where the secular market started from 2001, you know, you'll see and you get a different perspective, and it should give you a level of insur uh, of assurance that you're in the right place. So, um, just hold hold tight and uh, and keep the faith. Okay, sounds good. We're absolutely going to do that, Chris. Words of encouragement. We like that. Chris, how can our viewers get to know more about Neptune Global and the PMC Ounce? Sure. Best place is they can visit our website, which is neptuneglobal.com. Okay. And there they can learn about the company, look at the charts I talked about, you know, use the PMC calculator and just learn about us and our, our dealings as a precious metals dealer overall. So um, we always encourage people to come and visit and learn a little bit more about us. And I uh, really appreciate the you let it, letting me share that, Patrick. Yeah, we're we're happy that you that you joined us and um, gave us some insights on on the PMC Alt. It seems like a pretty interesting product, so we we do wish you well with that, and we'll be sure to uh, send viewers uh, to to your website. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. It was great thank talking to you. That was Chris Blasi, president at Neptune Global Holdings LLC. For more of his insights on precious metals, please visit his website neptuneglobal.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content.